YouTube at Hudson Riverkeeper. And we also will have a recording of the forum to share with folks after the event is over. So thank you for joining us. Welcome. Um, there's a hundred of you who have registered from, for this event from home. Um, we hope you're all staying safe and well wherever you are. My name is Renee Vogelsang. I am the campaign coordinator for Beyond Indian Point. Um, so welcome to this forum. First, we wanted to introduce the campaign. Beyond Indian Point is a campaign to move New York toward 100% renewable energy and energy efficiency as Indian Point shuts down in 2020 and 2021. The decision to shut down the Indian Point nuclear facility, reject fossil fuels, and transition to clean energy and efficiency is a proud model for what we can achieve across New York State and the nation. Beyond Indian Point is a campaign that's sponsored by Alliance for a Green Economy, FRAC Action, Nuclear Information and Resource Service, Food and Water Watch, and Riverkeeper, and includes many allies and supporters, including many of the organizations on this call. So we thank you for supporting us and for joining us. We hope this afternoon that you will learn about what the historic shutdown of Indian Point means for New York and about the clean energy future we can build together beyond Indian Point. A couple logistics before we get started. This forum goes until 5 p.m. We will be taking questions towards the end. You can submit a question by clicking on the question box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We may not get to every question during the Q&A portion. Some questions may be answered to you directly and some questions we can answer following the forum. Feel free to contact us at info at beyondindianpoint.com to follow up if you have questions that were not answered today. We also want to encourage everyone right off the bat to sign the petition at beyondindianpoint.com and join us as an endorser. Um, all of the attendees today will receive a follow-up email with information, including a link to endorse the campaign on behalf of your organization or business. So now I would like to give the mic to our panelists. Today's panelists include Paul Galay, president of Riverkeeper, Annalise Dillon, scientist at Physicians, Scientists, and Engineers for Healthy Energy, Jessica Azule, executive director at the Alliance for a Green Economy, Tim Judson, executive director at Nuclear Information Resource Service, and um, Alex Beecham, Northeast Regional Director at Food and Water Watch. And last but not least, closing music by Margot Sheppard, a songwriter and one of the original organizers at the Indian Point Safe Energy Coalition. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to our first speaker, which is Paul Galay at Riverkeeper. Paul. Renee, thank you. you so much. Thank you so much, Renee. And thank you to all of you who are attending. Uh, I've been with Riverkeeper for a decade. And when I first started, the manager at Indian Point asked to come in and see me. And uh, we, we had that meeting. And he said, now I know that Indian Point could never be sited in its current location if you wanted to build that plant new today. And I thought about that statement by him a lot over the years as the plant uh, went from 35 years old to 45 years old as we saw the problems mounting when the Fukushima accident took place and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, chairman said every, new, every American within 50 miles of Fukushima needs to get away from that site, thinking the 19 million people who live within 50 miles of Indian Point, thinking about how in one 12 month period just before the 2017 closure agreement, Indian Point suffered seven major malfunctions pump and power failures, a transformer explosion, radiation leaks, a fire and an oil spill. And then after the agreement was signed, we learned that 30% uh, of the bolts holding together the two reactor cores uh, were in failure state. And we only learned that because we forced the NRC to force Entergy to do that test back in the 90s when relicensing became too difficult for one of the plants that was coming up for relicensing. Uh, the NRC simplified the requirement and stopped requiring uh, inspections. And we got one. We saw just how difficult things had become at a plant like Indian Point at its age. 
with issues of embrittlement and bolt failure and the like. I thought about uh, Mr. DeSimo's statement when I read the uh, federal report stating that Indian Point has the worst risk of earthquake related meltdown of any plant in the country. And the state report saying that the evacuation plan for Indian Point is essentially only good on paper and would not protect us in a real world emergency. And so when I learned in late 2016 that Entergy was looking to close the plant and that they were looking for Riverkeeper's uh, concurrence in that decision, uh, I worked happily on a closure agreement that was signed in January of 2017. Entergy cited increased operating costs. Uh, they were unwilling to build the cooling towers they needed to qualify for Clean Water Act permits. And we agreed on four years uh, between the time of the closure agreement and uh, the actual final closure of the second reactor. Uh, the first reactor closed uh, several weeks ago and the uh, next reactor closes next April. Now, since Indian Point's closure was announced, uh, annual renewable energy generation uh, and energy efficiency savings have increased roughly to the extent of the entire first reactor that's been closed. And uh, clean resources now in uh, operation or under development will exceed what's generated by the entire plant by nearly 25% by 2024. And by 2025, Indian Point could be closed two and a half times over by the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act which provides for many thousands of megawatts of solar power, wind, and battery storage. There's a new siting law that was enacted in April that uh, fosters renewables projects, especially on brownfields, and provides host community benefits for the communities that uh, accept these facilities. And there are new air pollution control regulations that are driving old intermittently operated so-called peaker plants like Ravenswood in Queens to announce plans to shut down. Now, I know there are some people who are concerned about the impacts to the closing point. And I want to say that it's a false dichotomy to say that fossil fuels are a problem for the climate and that therefore we should keep an outdated, accident ridden, high risk nuclear plant with no viable evacuation plan in business decades after it was originally intended to close down. Renewable energy, energy efficiency, and battery storage will not only provide well over twice the energy of Indian Point by 2025, there are COVID-19 economic recovery program waiting to happen and a boot, a boon to efforts to reduce the um, use, uh, increase the use of states, brownfields, former industrial sites, landfills, and other abandoned or underused areas. Next steps, we have a decommissioning process. Entergy has initiated sale of Indian Point to a company known as Holtec. We have grave concerns about Holtec's reliability we also want to make sure that there is adequate public oversight and funding for communities who are in the area where tax receipts are going down because of Indian Point's closure. There's got to be active funding of the statewide cessation fund, which was created in recent years, and a fair and equitable allocation of the $15 million fund that was negotiated in the closure agreement for environmental and community uh, benefits. So in summary, Indian Point is closing. There's nothing to be done for it. It's old, it's uneconomical, and the company that runs it is done with running it. We will be safer when Indian Point is shut down. We were safer already when Reactor 2 shut down, and we're busy increasing renewables and energy efficiency since 2017 and are poised to do even more than we have done so far going forward. So thanks very much for this opportunity to speak with you. Thank you, Paul. Um, and you can go to riverkeeper.org if you want more information on Indian Point and the shutdown. Um, thank you so much for, for being here with us today, Paul. Uh, so our next speaker is Annalise Dillon. Annalise is a scientist at Physicians, Scientists, and Engineers for Healthy Energy. She's also the author of the recent re recently released research brief on um, New York's data on renewables and efficiency um, following Indian Point shutdown. So uh, with that, I hand it over to Annalise. Thanks so much, Renee, and um, thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, thanks to everyone for participating. Um, so like Renee said, my name is Annalise Dillon, um, and I work at Physicians, Scientists, and Engineers for Healthy Energy. 
Uh, we're based in Oakland, California, but our roots are actually in New York. We were founded by a physician, a scientist, and an engineer in Ithaca, New York. Um, and we study the public health, environmental, and social equity dimensions of energy production and use. Um, like Renee said, I authored the, um, a research brief that came out last month um, that really aimed to um, place the Indian Point retirement in, within the context of New York's recently accelerated climate and clean energy targets. Um, and so it's sort of looking forward now that the retirement is well underway, um, trying to answer the question, what will New York need to do in order to meet these uh, ambitious climate and clean energy um, targets and what is already um, occurring across the state. Um, so I'll just give an overview of the main points without going too much into the weeds. You can um, reference the research brief afterwards and I'm happy to answer any specific questions um, or follow-up questions. Um, so the report kind of has two main sections. Um, one looks at the local resources that um, NISO, the New York Independent System Operator, identified as being necessary following Indian Point's closure. Um, and the other main section looks at uh, the replacement of Indian Point's overall gener annual generation statewide. Um, so comparing the growth of renewable energy and energy efficiency savings statewide to the nuclear generation that's coming offline from Indian Point. Um, it can be hard to sort of um, keep the scale and easily compare the scale of what's coming offline, what's coming online in our heads. And so the research brief kind of aims to um, clarify that point. Um, so as many of you are uh, based in New York, I'm sure that you're already aware of the um, climate and clean energy targets that were passed last year. But just to reiterate, um, they call for New York to meet 70% of um, electricity with renewables by 2030 um, and for the reduction of economy-wide greenhouse gas emissions to 85% below 1990 levels by 2050. Um, and these are some of the most ambitious targets in the country. Um, yet at the same time, over, over the past few years, New York has built out new natural gas infrastructure um, amounting to around eight, uh, 1,800 megawatts of new generating capacity. Um, and so the report kind of calls into question, you know, we don't go into a full um, grid modeling analysis that's matching real-time demand to supply, um, but just in our, um, in our analysis, we kind of call into question this expansion of new natural gas infrastructure given New York's ambitious targets. Um, so first, uh, in the report, I, I look at the NISO generator deactivation assessment, which came out in 2017. Um, and it evaluates the local resource needs following Indian Point's closure. Um, and this an assessment found that in the absence of the recently built 1,800 megawatts of gas capacity, which I just mentioned, the local region served by Indian Point, which is in downstate New York, would need to add at least 200 megawatts of capacity by 2023 and at least 600 megawatts of capacity by 2027. In the research brief, I find that since the assessment came out in 2017, the local region served by Indian Point has already added enough solar and energy efficiency um, to meet the 2023 requirement of 200 megawatts. Um, it's already added enough to meet this in terms of summer peaking capacity, so when solar is the most abundant um, and is close to meeting this, this requirement as well in the winter, um, even when solar is not generating as much. Um, and so if these resources, local resources continue to be deployed at the same rate, they will far exceed the 600 megawatt requirement that NISO put forward um, by 2027. Um, and so what these numbers show is that it's not evident that um, new gas plants were needed to be constructed um, in order to replace the local capacity that Indian Point um, has historically provided. Um, NISO actually identified other possible solutions in its assessment and named specifically named generation and enhanced transmission capacity and other possible solutions, um, but did not pursue them because these um, gas plants that, were, um, that I mentioned were coming online already. Um, 
So there's sort of a missed opportunity there. And um, the report suggests that even though these gas plants um, have already been built, that there's still opportunities to minimize their usage um, by rapidly deploying um, renewable storage and energy efficiency going forward in line with New York's targets. Um, so briefly, the second part of the report that fo focuses on the recent growth and projected growth of renewables and energy efficiency statewide. Um, since Indian Point's closure was announced in January of 2017, annual renewable generation and energy efficiency savings have increased um, roughly 6,500 gigawatt, gigawatt hours statewide, um, which is almost half um, of Indian Point's generation in 2018. Um, so, so considerable progress has already been made. Um, and during this time as well, New York recognized the need to invest more heavily in renewable resources. Um, the state invested in large scale wind, solar and hydro projects and also awarded contracts for the first offshore wind projects which are scheduled to come online by 2024. So together clean resources that were recently deployed since, since the closure was announced or are under development will contribute roughly 20,000 gigawatt hours annually by 2024 exceeding Indian Point's annual generation of 16,000 gigawatt hours in 2018. Additionally, um, as Paul mentioned, the CLCPA targets call for an even, even greater additions of solar and energy efficiency by 2025. And if they are met, um, they will bring an additional 24,000 gigawatt hours online by 2025. Um, I realized I meant to share my screen. Um, so that there is a visual, but I will do that now. Um, and so that way um, you have a visual to kind of compare the numbers that I just gave. So the recently deployed is from the announcement of the closure in 2017 to 2019. Under development are projects that New York NYSERDA has already invested money into or um, distributed solar projects that are already um, have been you know, awarded um, PPAs or other contracts and are under development. Um, and the accelerated targets to the right shows um, the additional energy efficiency and distributed solar um, generation that will be added um, on an annual basis um, if those targets are met. Um, to the left is Indian Point, the annual generation that's coming offline. So in conclusion, um, our estimates suggest that renewables, storage, and energy efficiency growth uh, in line with New York's targets could provide sufficient generation and local capacity following Indian Point's closure, avoiding the need for a sustained increase in gas generation. Um, and this is really important as we look forward to other, um, as other power plants come offline and retire in New York in the future, um, it'll be critical that the state look to clean resources rather than gas um, to replace retiring capacity in order to meet these ambitious targets. Um, stop sharing my screen and thanks so much. Um, I'll pass it off to the next speaker. Thanks so much, Annalise. I just wanna remind everyone that you can check out the research brief at psehealthyenergy.org. Um, you can also check it out uh, on our website at beyondindianpoint.com. Um, I also want to give everyone a reminder and a welcome to new folks who've joined us uh, that you can click on the questions box at the bottom of your Zoom window to ask us a question. We may not be able to get to all the questions at the end, um, but we will follow up with you and you can email us at info at beyondindianpoint.com. Uh, and so moving on, uh, our next speaker is Jessica Azule at Alliance for Green Economy. Uh, take it away, Jessica. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. And I just want to say we're truly grateful to Annalise and PSC Healthy Energy for um, doing this analysis, which really meets a critical need for independent analysis in this moment as Indian Point goes through the shutdown process. Uh, we've seen a lot of speculation and misinformation out there, mostly being spread by pro-nuclear and pro-gas activists. And it's really important to have real data at this time. 
to set the record straight about what is and what is not happening with electricity in New York. So speaking for AGREE, uh, which is an organization working on um, statewide energy policy, trying to move us as rapidly as possible to a carbon-free and nuclear-free energy system, a key takeaway here um, is that we're really in a process toward a future where our energy sources are less polluting and less dangerous. And it's a process in which we're going to harness the power of human ingenuity to do more with less energy through energy efficient technologies and where we harness the energy of the natural environment to produce energy through solar, wind, water, and geothermal. And so I want to put the Indian Point shutdown um, in the context of this process and the transition that we're undergoing in New York right now because it is um, but one important milestone among many that the people of New York have fought for and won. I'm sure many of you will recall that before the shutdown agreement for Indian Point, there was the decision to ban fracking and all of the many years of protest and tens of thousands of public comments filed that made that happen. Um, this year, the same year that the first um, reactor at Indian Point is shutting down, New York closed its last coal plant um, as a result of years of activism that led to a major regulatory change that put coal out of business. The denial of permits for gas infrastructure projects, um, each one hard fought by the anti-fracking movement represent more steps to achieve 100% renewable energy in New York. And as um, Annalise mentioned, there have been all these contracts awarded over the last several years by New York State to incentivize new renewable energy projects, including offshore wind, and these were won through public pressure. Uh, last year, we saw the passage of the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which was fought for by the huge and growing New York Renews Coalition, and it's another tool, it's a legal tool to fight for an equitable transition to renewable energy and to hold policymakers accountable to aggressive targets and to really accelerate this transition. This year, we also got the new energy efficiency order from the Public Service Commission in January, which was the culmination of years of dogged activism by envir the environmental community. And it's going to accelerate um, this reduction in the energy that we need in New York that we are seeing already. Each wind farm that's completed, each solar installation, each energy efficiency retrofit, these steps all represent tireless work by our movements and our communities and they're building up to a new energy system that's centered around human health and the environment rather than extractive and unsafe fossil fuel and nuclear. And, you know, there have been some setbacks, um, to be sure. We saw the bailout of the upstate nuclear plants in New York to the tune of $7.6 billion. We saw the new gas plants that were built that didn't need to be built, as Annalise just mentioned in recent years because of the bad decision by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to create a lucrative electricity market in the Hudson Valley. And you know we've seen the legacy generators are fighting for their lives uh, with political influence and misinformation to discredit renewable energy. So we still have a long way to go and a lot of work to do. And that's why it's more important than ever for us to keep fighting together. And this is why we launched the Beyond Indian Point campaign. Uh, the closure of Indian Point, um, it's not an end point in the fight, right? It's a milestone. So we and our allies intend to keep working beyond this moment to share the numbers, to correct the record on the power of renewable energy and efficiency, and to help build the confidence through truth telling that we can say no to every dirty energy plant and pipeline in New York. We can see from the hard data, the results of the hard work of so many people who've been fighting for a livable future in New York. And we look forward to working with each and every one of you to keep fighting and to win a healthy and safe world for ourselves and our families and future generations. And I'm really excited to be working with everyone in this campaign. I wanna thank everyone for joining us um, on this forum and I hope to see you in this fight. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, now we'd like to toss it to Tim Judson at Nuclear Information Resource Service to get the national perspective. Tim? Hi, everybody. Um, and so thanks to, to everybody for, for participating today. And, um, and I really want to congratulate 
um, Riverkeeper and, and all of the groups um, that really have, you know, have fought um, for years, you know, for, for this moment uh, where we're phasing out Indian Point. And that includes Riverkeeper, uh, the Indian Point Safe Energy Coalition, uh, Hudson River Sloop Clearwater, Natural Resources Defense Council, uh, shut down Indian Point now in New York City, the Sierra Club and others. Um, you know, this, this is really a historic moment, um, you know, and not just for New York, um, but, you know, but, but for the whole country. And one of the reasons for that is that, um, you know, we are now um, moving beyond, um, you know, bad energy decisions that were made decades ago and moving forward, um, you know, ambitiously and proactively um, and aggressively, you know, to a new energy paradigm um, in New York and around the country uh, based on renewable energy and environmental sustainability and social justice. And, um, and it's really important that people understand um, that the closure and the phase out of Indian Point is an important chapter in that story. And, you know, part of the reason for that is that, you know, the, um, the one of the signs of that, I guess, is that the fight to close Indian Point um, has been going on almost since the first reactor was built at the site in the 1960s. This has really been um, decades and generations of, um, you know, of, of effort that has gone on um, to, to be able to phase out Indian Point and to bring New York to a saner and more sustainable energy future. Um, you know, my organization, Nuclear Information and Resource Service, was founded in 1978, and we've been working with New Yorkers to this end um, for almost all of that time. Um, and it spans, you know, any number of, of, of you know, of important issues and problems um, that, that made the closure in Indian Point necessary. Um, you know, from the, from the inadequacy and the impossibility of the emergency response plans uh, for a nuclear disaster at Indian Point, um, to the serious safety issues that have happened throughout the, throughout the plant's history, um, to all of the issues about national security that were raised post 9-11, um, you know, with, uh, with, the, with the jets that hit the Trade Center flying over Indian Point. Um, and, you know, and more recently, um, the serious issues related to the relicensing of the plant um, and the aging and embrittlement that Paul mentioned, um, as well as um, the, the rising concerns about um, the safety of nuclear power, um, you know, in uh, the post-Fukushima uh, climate change era where natural disasters um, really are having serious impacts on our infrastructure. Um, so, you know, and then to now with the retirement and the replacement of Indian Point, um, the fights to close Indian Point have always been about transforming the energy and environmental choices that we make in New York. You know, whether the, and, and that means whether the safety, health and sustainability of our communities and the environment can really come first. So that is why it is so important to get out the truth about what is ultimately replacing Indian Point. Um, it's important because New Yorkers deserve to know that we don't have to choose between one threat to our health and safety and another. We don't have to make a Sophie's choice between protecting downstate New York from a nuclear disaster and mitigating climate change and air quality impacts. We can and are doing all those things. The, PS the PSCHE report shows conclusively that the solutions to reducing greenhouse gas emissions and phasing out uh, nuclear power are the same. They're here now and that New York is on the right path. One of the keys to this is that New York has been proactive about preparing for the closure of Indian Point starting nearly a decade ago with investments in transmission and distribution upgrades and energy efficiency to make sure that there is no danger to, to the lights staying on after Indian Point closes. And more recently with increasingly strong programs to make to increase renewable energy and energy efficiency. In fact, you know what uh, what Annalise's report shows is that since 2017, when the close when the agreement to close Indian Point was announced, the state um, you know has added enough renewables and efficiency to supplant Indian Point Two, and that by 2023 the same will have been done for Indian Point Three. And overall, by the middle of the decade, the state is on track to add two and a half times as much renewable energy and energy efficiency than what the Indian Point, the largest power plant in New York State, has ever generated. There are voices who don't want New Yorkers to know this. The nuclear and fossil fuel industries don't want the public to believe that they are not needed to keep the lights on, that we can meet our energy needs affordably, cleanly, and sustainably with renewable energy and energy efficiency. And that reality is becoming more clear every year as the technology and cost of renewables are improving by leaps and bounds. Just as a for instance, um, from 2009 to 2019, the cost of solar, uh, solar power fell by 90% and the cost of onshore wind by 
both are now cheaper than fossil fuels and all other sources of electricity. And those trends are continuing, not just with solar and onshore wind. Offshore wind is maturing just as rapidly and beginning to take off in New York. Um, and that's happening glo both globally and in the US. In Europe, offshore wind projects are coming online without subsidies. And in the US, Massachusetts just contracted for an offshore wind farm at a cost of 5.8 cents per kilowatt hour, a drop of about 40% in just a couple of years. So the story of how New York is moving beyond Indian Point is also important nationally, because these same debates are happening around the country. And the truth is New York is not alone in phasing out nuclear power while reducing greenhouse gas emissions to protect the climate. California, Massachusetts, and Vermont are also ramping up renewables and efficiency fast enough to quickly replace nuclear power plants while meeting their emissions goals. And other states are already increasing renewable energy fast enough to do the same. And, and some of what you would think of as not the usual suspects, including Texas, Kansas, Oklahoma, and Iowa. So, you know, we are really at a moment when, um, you know, when we, when we don't, when we're, we, we can move forward, you know, to protect our environment and to provide clean energy jobs and, you know, affordably and sustainably for communities in New York and across the country. And that's, you know, really what's so important about this campaign to move beyond Indian Point is to be able to show concretely how one state is doing that with, with you know, with, 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 with its largest nuclear power plant. Um, and we're just very excited to be able to, to commemorate this moment with everyone, um, you know, and to be able to, to, get, to get these facts out to the public. Thanks, and I'll pass it to the next presenter. Thanks, Tim. Um, so our final speaker before we take questions is Alex Beecham at Food and Water Watch uh, to give us the latest on the campaigns to shut down gas and move to 100% renewables in New York. Alex. Great, thanks so much for, for having me. And um, I wanna thank everyone for, for joining. Um, and you know, I know that our goal here is to really look beyond Indian Point, right? What comes next in the fight, I do think it's worth mentioning, I, others have said it, but this is a giant, huge victory that as Tim mentioned, took generations of people working incredibly hard. And, you know, in some other world, someone would plan one or many fun things at a bar that obviously we're, we're not able to do. But I, I, I guess I'd say, you know, people should take a moment to both reflect and celebrate it because in this sort of fight against dirty energy projects, we lose our fair share. So although it's not the end of the road, right? As Jessica said, it's a milestone. You've really got to celebrate those things. So uh, I hope everybody does, right? Because um, it's exciting and, and sadly we can't, can't be together in person. Um, I, I want to say here that, you know, to us, we've always at Food and Water Watch and, and personally have always thought that, you know, the fight against fracked gas and the fight against nuclear power are, are really the same struggle, right? All of us are fighting against dirty energy projects. All of us are fighting uh, for a better future. All of us are fighting um, for a world that doesn't rely on carbon-based electricity, doesn't rely uh, on nuclear power with the myriad dangers it poses that, that others on the call have, have already uh, talked about more articulately than, than I can. Um, and so as activists, I think, it's really important not to fall into the false dichotomy or, or <laughs> the Sophie's choices, as Tim put it. Um, we don't have to choose between two terrible options, right? And, and as someone who worked, as many of those on the call did as well, for years and years and years to ban fracking, the entire debate seems very familiar to me, right? For years, people told us, well, look, you guys want to ban fracking. If you're going to do that, you got to rely on coal. That was nonsense and pitting this argument here is exactly the same kind of nonsense. We don't have to choose between nuclear and gas. We have to say no to both. There are real options uh, that is, as folks have said, some there's been real progress in the state uh, towards renewables, towards energy efficiency. We need much, much, much more, but the answer to that is not to choose one of these two bad options. It's to demand more of our elected leaders, to demand more of Governor Cuomo, of our legislators, et cetera. Um, so what does that look like, right? I mean, for us, the, the key thing, if you find yourself in a hole, the first step is putting down the shovel, right? And right now we're not only um, not moving fast enough, uh, we're also continuing to entertain new fossil fuel projects all over the state. That has to stop immediately and there's big campaigns to, to stop a whole bunch of them. Uh, I won't bore people on the call with running through uh, all the different um, projects a bunch of us are fighting, but I will say uh, there's two 
key ones that, that we're heavily involved in and that have decision points coming up. So one is the Williams pipeline that I'm sure many of the call are familiar with. This is the thing that uh, would go through New York Harbor, bringing frac gas from Pennsylvania through New Jersey, through the harbor, and then ultimately to, to New York. Um, we have to stop this. Governor Cuomo's denied it twice, both times in a way that allowed the company to reapply. There's an urgent deadline on this he faces in a couple of weeks. So we're going to know one way or another. Um, very, very important for folks to get involved in, in that fight. Um, I'd urge people to go stop the Williams Pipeline Coalition. Lots and lots and lots of great info there. Um, lots of ways to, to weigh in. But people should urge Governor Cuomo to reject that. Uh, and then as folks have talked about, we've unfortunately built a couple new gas plants in recent years. There are other ones proposed, perhaps most prominently uh, a plant called Dan Scammer in Newburgh. This is an old coal plant that right now is operating as a peaker plant. That means it fires up only on kind of the peak demand days, right? Um, we need to make sure that uh, Governor Cuomo rejects her proposal to turn that into a normal baseload facility that's running all the time, way more power, way more emissions. Uh, and this is a fight that we can win, right? It's early in the permitting process. Uh, it goes through the PSC, but like everything at the PSC, I would tell you that really uh, that's the governor's decision. So anything you can do to urge Governor Cuomo to reject that would be enormously important. Um, and then more broadly, I think as a movement, it's crucial that we keep building out uh, a broader um, campaign to reject not only each individual fight, right, that, that have their own local politics and everything around them, but that we need a broad call that for our elected leaders, we're not going to accept any new fossil fuel projects, right? No power plants, um, no new gas pipelines, compressor stations, storage facilities, whatever you could think of. Um, that movement has been building out with, with lots of people beyond, uh, beyond us at Food and Water Watch fighting it. Uh, but we need that to be bigger uh, now as we move beyond any point is the time to double down on this, to double down on fighting for a carbon free, nuclear free future. Um, and with that, I think I will turn it back to Renee. Thanks, Alex. Um, we appreciate all the work you're doing at Food and Water Watch um, and your um, work with us here. Um, we look forward to working with you all moving forward. Um, so thanks everyone once again for submitting your questions, uh, being with us today. Uh, we do have a lot of questions. We likely will not have time for all of them, but I'd like to start with um, a few of them that we have so far. And we're going to take the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes for these questions and stay tuned for our closing song from Margot Sheppard with Indian Point Safe Energy Coalition um, in closing info. So uh, our first, we actually, I'm gonna do two questions grouped together. One question is from Tim Molloy. Um, how are you addressing a just transition in local community needs, um, taking them into account? Uh, we also have a question from Kevin Camps. What can we do to stop the license transfer to the Rogue Corporation's Holtec International? Um, which would give them the keys to the $2 billion decommissioning trust fund, most of which they'd stick in their pocket while doing as little actual radiological cleanup. Um, oh, the question disappeared as I was reading it. Um, but I think we got the gist of that question. So, uh, oh, found it over here now. Um, wanna make sure I got all of your question, Kevin. Um, while doing as little actual radiological cleanup as they could get away with while also taking risky shortcuts on high level radioactive waste management. So um, I'll put that question out, um, both of those questions, both on a just transition and addressing local community needs, um, as well as the decommissioning question over to Paul. So these are important questions. Uh, the, the closure of reactor two and next closure of reactor three is step in a process and we have entire process work. We have to find ways to have the community become revitalized. Uh, they knew that this plant was going to close and didn't know that it would close when it did, but three years after the closure agreement, they're now working to the cessation fund, which needs a steady source of fund. And here, Assemblywoman Sandy Galef and State Senator Pete working hard uh, to try to make sure that there is a reliable source of funding. 
so that these communities can stabilize their budgets in the absence of Indian Point revenues going forward. Riverkeeper is part of the agreement uh, that to close Indian Point from 2017, which includes a $5 million fund for environmental and community projects. Uh, we want to see a fair and beneficial allocation of that fund to the communities. Transitioning more, pardon the pun, to the question of decommissioning as raised by Kevin Camps, we need to do several things before we can know but also be safely decommissioned. And the uh, decades of uh, spent fuel, 1,500 tons of which is on site and likely to remain on site for a very long time since there's nowhere to permanently. The issue of the company that Entergy wants to transfer this plant to is that they have a bad track. They're undercapitalized. They've made misrepresentations in seeking business and others. Consequence, Riverkeeper and a number of other parties have filed to try to fight this for united with the community, united with the state. The state has deep concerns about the financial wear of this um, whole uh, joint venture. And uh, the new jurisdiction as to the State Public Service Commission. Many of my colleagues are working on comments which we're going to submit to the public service uh, to battle this trend. There are better companies to do it. And whichever comes on responsibility, whether it's energy, other uh, authority, there has got to be financial oversight by the state. Uh, Senator Harcum and Assemblywoman Galef have also proposed an oversight board, which would be statewide. In Indian Point would be the first time it would be put into effect but we need effective oversight at the level. And we are more than happy, Riverkeeper, to help support uh, funding the cessation fund, finding uh, adequate, having the community covering from the fiscal impact of the closure. Thank you, Paul. Um, so we have another question. Uh, submitted anonymously. The question is, are CPV and Cricket Valley going online to compensate for losing Indian Point's output? Um, either Annalise or Jessica want to take that one? Yeah, sure. I can answer that question. Um, so like I mentioned, um, the research brief um, that I wrote looks at the at NISO's um, generator deactivation assessment, which um, basically was analysis conducted by NISO to look at um, what local resources would be needed to meet grid reliability needs following the closure of Indian Point. Um, and they actually ran a, a scenario in their analysis that looked at what would be needed in the absence of recently constructed gas plants like CPV um, and Cricket Valley. Um, and so I think the fact that they ran the analysis in the first place sort of speaks to the fact that they saw that there were other um, possible solutions to like look, to look into. Um, and the findings are also um, important in that they uh, identified that only 200 megawatts of local resources would be needed by 2023 to meet grid reliability needs following the closure and 600 megawatts would be needed by 2027. Um, they actually explicitly mention other possible solutions, including renewables, enhanced tr transmission capacity. Um, and so that really um, sort of demonstrates that while the gas plants, um, including CPV and Cricket Valley, have been cited as um, filling that resource need, um, the, the assessment itself um, indicates that other, other solutions were possible. Um, and so these plants were not um, built exclusively for that purpose and did not need to be built in order to fulfill um, grid reliability needs following the closure. I, I guess the only thing I would add is that, you know, from a movement perspective, I talked about how we need to shut down or not shut down, how we need to stop new fossil fuel projects from being built. That's obviously only the, the barest minimum, right? Like the first step we could possibly do ultimately, and not even ultimately, but in the short term, 
uh, we have to start shutting down existing fossil fuel infrastructure across New York. Certainly that includes CPV and Cricket Valley, but it's much broader than that, right? We have to start running campaigns to shut all of these things down. And at least from my perspective, it's crucial that that, that half of it exists. You know, there's a narrative sometimes out there that like, well, renewable energy is coming. And so these things are gonna have to shut down. And there's a certain truth to that, but to my mind, like Indian Point and like so many of these other facilities, you're going to need a robust active campaign on the negative side of that, right? Saying shut down X, right? Fill in the power plant. And so to me, that's where the kind of um, fracked gas infrastructure movement uh, I think is heading, but, but I would argue we need to head there faster. Thanks, Annalise and Alex, uh, for taking those que that question. Uh, we have another question that was submitted uh, by John Burke. His question is, what about the gas line running under or near the reactors at Indian Point, especially during the next year with one last reactor running? Do we have someone who can take that one? Uh, yeah, this so, is Tim. Well, Paul, why don't you go ahead and I'll fill in anything else. Okay. So the AIM pipeline is a project that we had a lawsuit over uh, and um, we were shocked to see that uh, even acknowledged that the uh, federal analysis of the safety endpoint in proximity to the AIM pipeline uh, had been completely whitewashed over. And of course, after the inspector general determined that there had been a whitewash uh, the um, NRC decided to go back and do another study, and, and it was a second whitewash. So pipeline issue is a very real and present danger. It's one of the many reasons that we need to close Indian Point. Uh, it has some jurisdiction, but it's very limited, and the facilities in charge have shown no willingness to come to grips with the issues raised by the AIM pipeline. So, Tim, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Um yeah, well, just, yeah, to fill in, I think that um, this is clearly an example, um, you know, where federal regulators uh, really failed to do the kind of objective analysis that was necessary um, that, you know, should have concluded that, you know, that it, that it was actually completely irresponsible to, to cite this, this, you know, huge gas pipeline so close to an operating nuclear power plant. And, um, and that's, and I think we're still going to be reckoning with the danger of that even after Indian Point is closed. Um, because there's still going to be the spent fuel pools on site and things that are, you know, that, that are going to be, um, you know, ongoing safety risks that we, that, that, that we need to mitigate as much as possible. Um, so I think that, you know, we need to demand, you know, more and better of our regulated or regulatory agencies um, to, like I said, you know, put health and safety first, you know, ahead of um, these really short-sighted, um, you know, and uh, pro you know, proposals for, for fossil fuel projects, um, you know, in New York and in other states. Thanks, Thanks Tim. Um, so we have another question about um, the consequences of the Indian Point. What about the fish? How will this closing help life in the Hudson River? So, uh, this is an issue keep for over 40 years and uh, Con Ed owned the plant and they said, well, there aren't enough fish in the Hudson to make it worth trying to protect the fish. And of course, we found out that the Hudson is trying to make a comeback and that Indian Point has a, a cooling system that takes uh, well over 2 billion gallons of water a day from the Hudson to cool the plant and destroys all the biological life that is in that 2 billion plus gallons of water. Uh, the state said you need to build a closed cycle system energy that would reduce that mortality by 95% and energy uh, refused. They fought a tooth and nail. Con Ed before them did the same thing. So uh, the plant could have gotten its license had it been willing to uh, build those cooling towers, but they refused. And now when Indian Point is completely shut down, uh, the uh, result will be that a billion fish, eggs, and larvae a year will not be destroyed by the cooling system. So the fish will be safer, the people will be safer. In New York State, we have already reduced fossil fuel generated power by a greater amount than Indian Point 2 supplied. 
just since the closure agreement was signed. This can be a win-win-win. And as I mentioned earlier, it can also be an opportunity for a COVID-19 jobs creation program. So yes, let's put Cricket Valley and CPV out of business. Let's turn them into stranded assets. As has been referred to repeatedly, the price of renewables is coming down. The laws designed to incent their creation and their siting are getting stronger and stronger. The contracts are in place to close Indian Point twice over. We've earned the first reactor's closure and will better than earn the second reactor's closure as well. Thanks, Paul. Um, so we are at 4.55 and this forum ends at 5 p.m. We do have a lot of questions um, that we were unable to answer during this Q&A portion. Um, so we will answer those questions. Um, either email us at info at beyondindianpoint.com um, and we'll also track uh, the questions that we have here and get in touch with you. Um, I will also be sending follow-up information to everybody uh, to make sure that you have our endorsement form, um, our website, our petition, the physician, scientists, and engineers for healthy energy report, um, and you know everything you need to learn more about the campaign and get involved. Um, so I will make some more closing remarks in a minute, but we wanted to close out the forum with a, a song about clean energy from Margot Shepard. She is a songwriter and she's also one of the founding organizers at the Indian Point Safe Energy Coalition. So without further ado, Margot, take it away. Okay, I'm unmuted. I think I'm unmuted, right? I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, all right, so this is, um. This is a living document, this song. I wrote it 12 years ago, I'm sorry, wrote it in 2012 and uh, hopefully we'll be able to continue to update it with all the good stuff that's happening. Way back in the old days when I came home late at night, it was dark until I felt around and hit the light. But now we have contraptions with micro sensor dots. When they detect me or a bug, they blast 500 watts. I don't object to progress and I love technology. I think it's great that I can use my phone to watch TV. But we have problems with our grid that have to be addressed. It's time to put our scientific thinking to the test. We've got so much energy that we can't see the light. Little gray dots and little red numbers blink at us all night. We sent a human to the moon. There's really no excuse to not be using cleaner, smarter ways to make our juice. We can make power however we want. After all, we are the USA. But why does living in freedom pursuing happiness mean we should ignore the cleaner way daytime we have sunlight which is good for peak demand water is predictable when tides rise to the sand night times when the strongest wind blows turbine blades around and geothermal gives us steady warming from the ground here is the key to reliability. Mix and match renewables, they're clean and fuel free. Diversify the sources, spread them out along the road. Marry the portfolio to balance out the load. We have long transmission lines that give our grid its name. They overlap for miles and when they fail, we go insane. We need much smaller power producers close to work and homes. Distributed generation to replace the towers and domes. Low impact hydropower can be stored for later use. We're reinventing batteries to hold grid level juice. To improve the infrastructure so it functions like it should. Distributing renewables to every neighborhood. All 
the fuels from the earth are pumped, or mined, and milled. Untold contamination and so many barrels spilled. Renewable technologies are here and here to stay. With more green jobs created for green workers every day. Polar ice is melting and the weather is really weird. We're heading toward the temperature that scientists have feared. So we've got to spread the message of the Greener Thinkers Guild. The most efficient power plant is one you never build. We've got so much energy that we can't see the light. Little green dots and little red numbers blink at us all night. We sent a human to the moon. There's really no excuse to not be using cleaner, smarter ways to make our juice. Let's bring on all those cleaner, smarter ways to make our juice. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Margo. Um, and thank you for the work of the Indian Point Safe Energy Coalition and uh, Indian Point's shutdown and making our lives all safer. And you know, music uh, is also just such an uplifting thing that I think we all need, especially in a time like this. Um, and it's a great tool to educate and inspire and warm our hearts. So we really appreciate you ending this program um, with that beautiful song. So thank you. Love thank you so much for being with us. Um, and thank you to all of you. Um, thank you to our panelists. Thank you to our Zoom hosts. Um, thanks everyone at home, you know, staying safe and healthy for joining us here today. Once again, you can learn more and sign our petition at beyondindianpoint.com. And uh, look out for, for an email from us with a link to endorse the campaign um, and all the other information that has been brought up on this forum today. Uh, so, bye everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, at our online forum and uh, stay tuned as we move ahead. And congratulations everyone on, on, the, on the, all of our supporters who attended and all of our panelists today. Thank you.